central theorem of Markov chain is called ergodic theorem. Have you heard this expression before? Ergodic theorem? If you haven't, I'm going to tell you what it is. It turns out, I'm going to state this slightly loosely, but you understand what it means. That for every initial distribution, however you start the Markov chain, this chain, this Markov chain, if you keep going for long enough, converges to a limit distribution. Oh, thank you very much. I to a limit distribution. And this limit distribution, in fact, is unique. And this limit distribution is often called by physicists statistical equilibrium. That's, for example, the equilibrium state that you get in statistical physics. Stationary distribution, that's right. Um, so limited, uh, stationary distribution is absolutely correct in the theory of Markov chains. If you know that word, so much the better. I didn't write it because people seem to understand it a little better. But anyway, stationary distribution and static equilibrium as time goes to infinity. We shall prove this wonderful ergodic theorem rather easily. And the reason the proof is easy, although the result is deep and useful, is thanks to the power of topology, power of thinking in terms of pictures. I should say that there are many different versions of ergodic theorem. This is not the only one. I stated the one that is clearest, but there are many others that you might encounter throughout your scientific career. And some of them need techniques from outside topology. But this one, this simple one, can be completely understood in terms of topology. Another comment that I shall make before starting the proof, another comment, I said it converges to a limit distribution. In other words, if you keep iterating, very soon you see some distribution, say 2,000 rabbits here, 3,000 rabbits here, 100 rabbits here, only one rabbit here, and 20,000 uh, 20, rabbits here, and so on, such that when you keep applying the Markov chain, it doesn't change. That's why, as Shema said, it's a stationary distribution, it's a limit distribution. Okay? So it's a distribution of probabilities probability distribution that no longer evolves. You have reached an equilibrium. The temperature has settled and so on. Okay. It doesn't have to be a uniform distribution. You get the uniform distribution if all the jump probabilities are the same, but otherwise it's going to be have more probability here, less probability here, and so forth. But you get a limit distribution. Now, it's a little annoying to have a mathematician saying it converges to a limit because Natural scientists, we scientists, want to know how fast it converges. Mathematician says, oh, when n goes, t goes to infinity, it converges. But we want to know, for example, when t is 100, has it already more or less converged? Maybe it's not going to be exactly the limit, but maybe it's very close to the limit. Or maybe after 100 steps, we are still very far away. We don't know. However, Although I, won't be, I will not be able to explain this, that convergence is extremely fast, it turns out. So, for all intents and purposes, after several steps, you can assume that your state is roughly in equilibrium. That's why the world, most of the world we see, is in equilibrium much of the time. Yeah. As soon as we go away from equilibrium, whoop, very quickly we come back to the equilibrium. After all this speech, let's prove this uh, result. The key remark is the one that you have been using in exercises yesterday and the day before. The limit distribution is a fixed point of this mapping G. Why is this? 
You see, if you look at this uh, formula, it's also true that P1 at T plus 1 and Pm at T plus 1 is equal to G applied to P1 T to Pm T, correct? So take the limit on both sides as T goes to infinity. What do you get? Well, you get the equation that the limiting distribution at time infinity is equal to G applied to the same distribution, which shows exactly that when you apply G, this distribution vector does not move. So the limiting distribution, the limit distribution, is a fixed point of G. And you can see how the Brow fixed point theorem can be applied. So the problem then is to prove the existence of a fixed point. In other words, because G is a matrix, what does this say? It says, remember G is a matrix, M by M matrix. It says that this vector is an eigenvector. You see, because if I apply this matrix, this vector becomes proportional to itself. But Xavier, it's an eigenvector, but what's the eigenvalue? Xavier? One. It becomes one times itself. So, or to find, to prove the existence of an eigenvector, with eigenvalue 1. There is something else, though. It's not enough to find an eigenvector with eigenvalue 1. For example, suppose that you found an eigenvector which looks like this. 1, minus 2, and minus 0 0.1. Suppose that this eigenvector has eigenvalue 1. That's not what we want, because all those entries are probabilities. <laughs> they cannot be negative. Furthermore, they must add up to 1. So that's no good. So you want an eigenvector who's such that each pi is positive for all i, and the sum of the pi's is 1 with eigenvalue 1. That's what we want. You see, it has a lot of constraints. But those constraints, the constraints will be of advantage to us, it turns out. You might have been watching carefully and might have noticed that I'm cheating a little. I said the problem is to find an eigen value or a fixed point, in fact, you should also prove that this convergence takes place. You see, the way I presented the argument says that if it converges, then the limited distribution is the, eigen, is the eigen vector and so forth. But I haven't quite said why this converges. I will skip this step with apologies. It is not difficult. And if you are interested, I'll be able to I'll show you. But that step is purely analytical. You have to write some inequalities, and you see that the convergence takes place. And you moreover see, Nadia remembers, that the convergence is very fast. I'll skip that step, because it's not related to topology. And I'd like to show you, focus on the topological part of the argument, which is to prove the existence of one fixed point of the eigenvector, probabilistic eigenvector, with eigenvalue 1. Right. The statement, this existence, <coughs> has a name. The existence of an eigenvector like this, with eigenvalue 1, this thing, I'm sorry, I'm going to write right here, is called Perron-Frobenius theorem. 
which has quite a lot of applications in applied sciences. Two people. Perron proved it in 1907. Frobenius, who was a great professor in Berlin, proved it in 1912. And for some reason, both people got the credit. That's very nice. Huh? You prove something five years after somebody else, and you still get remembered. But in general, you should be aware that in mathematics and in science, when you see some result called after somebody, you know, for example, something is called um, the Brownian motion, well, it probably was not discovered by Mr. Brown. Usually the name of a result is not that of a discoverer, of the discoverer. It's probably somebody else. And history is complicated. Yeah. So this principle that the result in science, in mathematics in particular, is almost never named after its true discoverer is called Tadashi's principle. <laughs> because it was not discovered by me. <laughs> I hope you use this principle to your advantage. Let's then discuss and establish the existence of an eigenvector of G with all positive entries and such that they adapt one, whose eigenvalue, as Xavier points out, is one. Note that the Again, we are going to essentially draw a picture. The space of all probability distributions which I write it like this. P1 through Pm. You see that's the probability of being in state 1, probability of state 2, and so on. And this simply is a vector in Rn such that, as I, we wrote, pi is all positive for all i, and the sum of the entries is 1. Such a space can be drawn as a picture. Wonderful. Is you might call a tetrahedron or generalized tetrahedron, by which I mean a shape like this, but please realize that I mean the shape with the solid interior also. How do I mean that of dimension m minus 1? Here is how. Let's do it in the case m equals 2. There are only two states. So p1 and p2, those are the axes. And I'm drawing only the first quadrant, this part, and not the rest of the plane, because P1 and P2 must be positive, both of, both of them, it's greater than 0. And they must adapt 1. So what does the picture of P1 plus P2 equal 1 look like? I hope you can draw this in one second. It looks like this. Huh? That's 0, that's 1, that's 1. If you are anywhere on this yellow line, it is the case that p1 plus p2 is 1, the sum is 1, and each of p's is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. Now, that doesn't look really like a tetrahedron or a triangle, but watch next. Case m equals 3. p1, p2, and p3. I hope you are seeing the picture that I'm seeing. I'm looking at the corner of a, of a room. P1, P2, and P3. Okay. In this space, this part, the octant, the part that's sticking out towards you, has the property that all the P's are positive. In this octant, what does this set, this set look like? I hope you can draw this set in two seconds. It looks like this. You take a point on the P1 axis at distance 1 from the origin, P2 axis at distance 1 from the origin, and P3 axis at distance 1 from the origin, and you connect those three points, that gives you a triangle which is put into a corner. Not all the way into the corner, but sort of put into a corner, and this triangle is exactly 
this shape that's um, represented there. P1 plus P2 plus P3 equals to zero, uh, is, is equal to 1. Now it looks like a triangle, right? This is, if you like, a one-dimensional triangle. That's a two-dimensional triangle. Yes? And in higher dimensions, triangles are called tetrahedrons. In dimension three, you know what it looks like, I hope. That's exactly the picture I drew before. It has four vertices, and then you connect them, and there's an the interior. It looks like this. It's difficult to imagine this, perhaps, because we cannot draw the picture still of a four-dimensional space and see what the set P1 plus P2 plus P3 plus P4 equals 1 looks like. But it looks like this, essentially. That's why I call them tetrahedron. And it's between quotation marks, because it's not quite tetrahedron. I mean, tetra means four faces, so it's not really four. But in dimension, m minus 1 is the same. What is very important is that G acts on this tetrahedron in any dimension. And this tetrahedron is homeomorphic to a ball of dimension m minus 1. Why is this? Let's check that it's homeomorphic to b minus 1. For example, is it true that this yellow thing is homeomorphic to b of 2 minus 1? What is b of 2 minus 1? It's b of 1. Yes? What's the one-dimensional ball? Hey? It's a segment, it's a line between minus 1 and 1. So you see it's homeomorphic. It's topologically the same shape. Next, let's check this statement in dimension two, uh, dimension three. What's b of three minus one? It's b two, two-dimensional ball. What does two-dimensional ball look like? It's called, it's called a disk. Yeah, disk. Does it look like a disk? Well, yes. Topologically, it's a disk. You have this one has corners, but it doesn't matter. It's a disk topologically, and so on and so on, of dimension m minus one. What does it mean to act? It means the following. Let's say that I start from, for example, somewhere here. So P1 is something, P2 is something. And then I apply this matrix G, in this case, two by two matrix, and that gives me P1 and P2 at the next moment in time. Yeah? But the new P1 and P2 must still stay on this line. Yes? because it's a probability distribution. So all it's doing is that I move this point to maybe somewhere else. And each point on this line moves to some other point on this line. Similarly here, let's say that you have a case, a Markov chain with three states. We are in this situation. And suppose that P, uh, the state 1 has a probability P1, state 2 probability P2, state 3 being probability P3. So we are somewhere on this triangle at time 0. What's going to be the probability distribution at time 1? Well, I apply this g to the vector p1, p2, p3, and then I get a new vector. Okay? That new vector is the probability distribution at time 1. But that means that I still have to stay on this triangle. So I have a map from this triangle of good itself. A special map, that's the action of g. Similarly, in any dimension, G is mapping this tetrahedron, or to be precise, this set, to itself all the time. Is that clear? Okay, more or less. So G takes this set and maps it to itself. But this set is homomorphic to a ball. So Brava applies and says that there must be a fixed point. And automatically, this fixed point satisfies the constraints, because we are applying fixed point theorem in this set. End of proof. Let's take maybe two or three minutes in order to see examples of how this works. And then you might see this argument and the picture a little better. Consider a Markov chain with only three states. So this phenomenon, this universe, this system, can be in one of the three states. State 
let's call this state 1, let's call this state 2, and let's call this state 3. Okay? For some reason, I'm writing 2, 1, 3. I, I don't know why I'm writing this in this order. And then we shall assign how they jump. Let's say that if I'm state 1, I always stay at state 1. So I jump from state 1 to state 1, or remain at state 1 with probability 1. I don't go anywhere else. Let's also say that if I'm in state 2, I move to state 1 with probability 1. And if I'm at state 3, I move to state 1 with probability 1. In other words, this is really a deterministic process. You understand? At each moment of time, I'm sure what to do next. There is no probabilistic uncertainty. I just move. Now, suppose that you start from some probability distribution, and then I run this Markov chain. What do you think will happen? After one step, what happens? All the rabbits, which were distributed in state 1, state 2, state 3, what happens to them? They all jump to state 1 and stay there forever. So that's the limited distribution. Limited distribution is that at any later time, if you look at this system, after you run the Markov chain, you are sure to find everyone in state 1. In other words, the state is in state 1 with probability 1, and you can never find the state in, probability, uh, in state 2 or state 3. Okay? So the limited distribution, if you think of the vector P1, P2, P3, should be P1 is 1, and P2 and P3 are 0. 1, 0, 0. That should be the limit distribution. Right? Let's see if that's really the case. In this case, what is G? Well, remember what this is? This is the probability that 1 jumps to 1, so it's 1. What was this probability here? 2 to 1. So the probability that 2 jumps to 1, and that's 1, and 3 jumps to 1, that's 1. Here is the probability that 1 jumps to 2, which is 0, 2 jumps to 2, which is 0, and it's 0, 0, 0 everywhere. Can you calculate the square of this matrix, the cube of this matrix, g times g, g times g times g, g times g times g? Can you calculate this? Well, in principle, you can. But let's note that 1, 0, 0 is a fixed point. Is that true? Huh? If I apply this to 1, 0, 0, what do you get? 1, 0, 0. So it doesn't move. And it turns out to be the only fixed point. And we check. Please do the check if you are worried. If you are not worried and optimistic, please trust me. <laughs> that g squared is simply equal to g itself. And similarly, for any t not equal to 0, gt is just g. So for any all initial distribution, p1 and p2 and p3, there are three of them. So p2 and p3, 0, 0. 0, we have that the limit of G super T of P1, 0, P2, 0, P3, 0. So this is the probability distribution time T is simply equal to G single power, because you know, for any T, it's equal to G of P1, 0, P2, 0. P3, 0. And if you remember what G really looks like, it's very easy to see. It is equal to, what's the first component? <coughs> if I apply this G to this? Huh? Uh, say that a little more loudly, please. I, I'm hard of hearing. Huh? It's one, but before you do the calculation, what happens if I apply this? Yeah, that's right. P1, 0 plus P2, 0 plus P3, 0, yes? And elsewhere, you get 0 and 0. But what is this sum? It's of course 1, because, you know, 
I am talking about probability. So this is equal to 1, 0, 0. So you see that the fixed point is the limit distribution. Lim limit is the fixed point that we, we found. So this is working. Let us discuss another example, which is only slightly more complicated, but not so trivial. And this is our last example. Shame to erase this picture, but okay. Example 19. Let's now discuss a system with only two states. State 1. State two, okay, and we'll not make it deterministic anymore. We'll make it probabilistic. Let's say that state one jumps to state two with the property three fourths, okay, and state two jumps to state one with property one third. In that case. There are two more arrows here. State 2 goes to state 2, and state 1 goes to state 1. What is the probability assigned to this arrow? One fourth, because this and this must account for all the possibilities, and here it's two thirds. Easy enough. OK, let's consider this Markov chain. The transition or the generator matrix simply looks like this one fourth and Three fourths. Uh, no, this is not true. Two th that's one third, and this is three fourths. I mean, I think that's right. And two thirds. Okay. You might have noticed that if you take the generator and add each column, each column adds up to one, and that's because we are talking about probabilities. Excellent. What is a fixed point of this matrix? It's not easy to see. However, maybe the fixed point is not easy to see, but you can find out by calculation, certainly, right? What you're doing is you apply this to P1, P2, and it should be equal to P1, P2. You have two equations, two unknowns. So you can certainly find what P1 and P2 are. Effectively, the, act, the calculation you're doing is exactly the same calculation as the one for finding eigenvectors and eigenvalues. You must have done such calculations an enough number of times in your undergraduate days when you learned linear algebra, matrix theory, and so on. Well, this is the kind of problem where it's used. It actually has a meaning. And I did this calculation at home. And if I'm not mistaken, 4 thirteenths and 9 thirteenths is a fixed point. It turns out. And you can trust me. Your life is short, so is mine, but you know, I devoted some of my life to make your life more pleasant. Now, I do have one comment about this. To say that it's a fixed point means that if I apply g, this vector becomes itself. But what if I take twice this vector? What's going to happen? If I apply g, well, it's going to be twice this vector too. Yes? So that's also a fixed point. For that matter, that's also a fixed point, and so on. Yes? In particular, 4, 9, that's a fixed point of this matrix. Why did I choose this one rather than this one? Exactly, because those are supposed to be probabilities. It's nice that I find a fixed point with positive entries, but also the entries must add up to 1. That's why I divided by 13. So what happened when I did the calculation was, I found this first, but I said, oh, we have to normalize to make them probability, so I divided by 13. OK? Anyway, that's a fixed point. Therefore, we know from the general theory of Markov chains and the theory, theorem in particular that we proved that for every initial distribution,
P1 of 0 and P2 of 0, that the limit as time goes to the future of GT of this applied to this uh, initial distribution. So this is the probability of being states 1 and 2 at time t must converge to 4 13 and 9 13. Amazingly enough. Do you understand what this is saying? It's saying that whatever initial vector I choose, for example, if I choose the vector 1, 0, maybe it's the simplest. And then, 1, 0, vector 1, 0, I keep this up, applying this matrix over and over and over and over again to 1, 0. Quickly, I converge to this vector. Yeah, that's it. And similarly, if I start from any other thing, 0, 1, I apply this over and over again, you converge to, to this vector. What Shema is commenting is that there are different kinds of Markov chains, but regular Markov chain and irreducible component and so forth, that's the interesting part. I mean, there are other words like non irre irreducible, irregular, and so on. But those words are introduced in order to think about uninteresting cases in some sense. So that's the heart of the. That's the simplest but the difficult part of the theory. And once we understand it, the rest is just language. OK? The theory of Markov chains, as I explained, is very central to probability. And as you might have guessed, probabilistic thinking, especially thinking in terms of stochastic or random processes, is very, very useful in modern sciences. I hope you like it. And I hope you appreciate that topology finds its use even in areas like this. Okay. <laughs>